I need for my community right now is love. And if we do that, people like me will survive this. Because yeah. I don't know many people who, I don't know many leaders, particularly superintendents, who are leading this type of conversation and survive it. Yeah. They find all kinds of reasons for you not to be superintendent anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? They superintendent of the Ithaca City School District. I guess the first thing I'll ask is today is October 5th, so this would be the first day of classes. Um, tell us how, how's everything going so far? Very well. Today was a good day. Uh, it's been so refreshing to go around all day meeting the needs of young people for a change. It's been 250 plus days since we last had students in buildings, and since then, it feels as if uh, my day has been dominated by dealing with adults. The anxieties, the emotions, uh, the issues that we adults have around responding to the health and social pandemics. 2020 marked the start of a new decade and with it, new possibilities. However, the year has been a roller coaster of emotions for educators across the country as the United States has seemingly been hit with two pandemics, COVID-19 and the all too familiar issue of racial injustice. As the way of teaching the next generation has evolved drastically, educators were forced to reflect on what they were doing and change it overnight. Those effects were felt right here in Ithaca, New York. Yeah, March 13th, 2020 was the toughest day of my professional and personal career <laughs> of yeah. life. Um, when we had to say to families, we will not be open tomorrow because of this health pandemic. And there have been weeks of conversations about whether or not we should be here or should not be here. You know, typically um, before COVID, um, the snow day decision I had to make was always a tough decision <laughs> to make. And it felt like I had been in a two week long snow day decision. And now that's turned into about 256 days of snow day decisions. As the public health situation began to get worse, Dr. Brown knew he had to make a tough decision for the safety of his students and his staff. A decision to close the doors of every building throughout the school district. And those doors remain closed until October 5th when students were then given the choice to return to the school building with intense safety protocols or continue their education online from home. But it took a lot of thought and planning from administrators to get to that point. That was a tough decision that had been brewing because of you know the rising infection rates. And then when we made that decision, we had to change our instructional delivery model overnight. We said to families on a Friday night, we won't be in school on Monday. And we need, then needed to reimagine an industry that has not changed for two centuries overnight. Yeah. And that's where we've been the last six or seven months. And folks, particularly in the academic community like ours, they are expecting us to be excellent and perfect right now. Yeah. And that's going to be difficult as we're doing something completely different with an unprecedented and, and in a situation where we rarely get to be with one another in a space. At this moment, we have 22 patients in the United States currently that have coronavirus. Unfortunately, one person passed away overnight. She was a wonderful woman. Can you explain just briefly the difference between isolation and quarantine, and who in this community has the authority to manage both? Excellent question. So with respect to quarantine, those are well persons who may have had contact with others, exposures, as they say, within individuals, um, either through travel, which has been the primary concern, international travel, or, or contact with known persons with COVID-19. So the, um, with, in contrast, isolation is for those persons who are confirmed to have COVID-19. So those are persons who are sick, exhibiting symptoms, and are then isolated. Those decisions about either quarantine or isolation are made by the county health department. 
what they've indicated is that when they are asking folks to quarantine, they are doing so for a 14-day period based on when symptoms um, may present. They are doing daily checks of those individuals, uh, typically by phone, asking about symptoms, fever, other things that may be indicators uh, that they could be uh, contracting or ex developing COVID-19. But those are all those decisions are made by the county health department. Um, so again, thank you both. Again, mm -hmm. phenomenal job there. Um, in terms of that particular thing, just to follow up on that, so. Mm -hmm. Given that um, children typically aren't showing a lot of symptoms, are there recommendations for students who might have come in contact with someone who becomes symptomatic? Do we have any guidelines on that? Um, not at this time, but that, again, is a situation that may evolve and we would uh, rely on the expertise of the public health department to advise us. Today I am officially declaring a national emergency. any sort of silver lining where you can look at this and sort of be like, well, we've had to do all of this work to reimagine what education is so we can keep kids safe. Now, how can we keep building off of that and keep, I, I guess, like moving forward in a way that is also safe, yeah. but, all, but you know, I get the, like new, like yeah. a new sort of way to teach. We are an institution that is built to be inequitable and was not built to serve the needs of every one of our young people, particularly those living in poverty and those of color. We've now needed to change everything we do to now meet the needs of all of our young people. And every student needed a laptop to learn and food to eat. And it was up to the school district to figure out how to make that happen and make it happen quickly. I was here just a year ago. We were struggling with whether or not we should send home electronic devices to young people or let them take them home. Um, I, you, you were in this district, but people gave me a hard time about going with the one who wanted to yeah. Now we can't get those devices out fast enough. Yeah. There were times when people were giving us a hard time about how we allow for young people to purchase meals or how we fed them. And if, you, you know, if a young person had a debt on their lunch account, they shouldn't eat or they should have a cheese sandwich. Now we're getting food out to everyone. Yeah. And Brown said it's all about changing the culture of learning, striving beyond each student getting an A, but obtaining an education that makes them critical of the world around them. Yeah, I mean, that's why our vision is 6,000 plus thinkers. Yeah. Um, to achieve that bold vision, we will then have young people and educators asking questions like, for example, right now, why is it that most of the people dying from COVID-19 are black and brown? Right. If we just simply ask that question, it could uncover history, laws, biases that rarely come inside of a classroom. Yeah. Just the conversation. So if we're truly thinking, we then can ask the right questions. And the right questions aren't always easy to ask. They can be dividing and drive a wedge between students' and teachers' ideologies and ways of life. But Brown acknowledges that there are critical questions and critical conversations that have to be had. But that's what I see oftentimes in... Uh, white supremacy culture, which is what schools is based on, yeah. when asking these questions about oppression and marginalization um, is typically seen as um, too rogue or unpopular or controversial, mm -hmm. and we need to have it be much more normal. Yeah. Um, that's the conflict that's constructive that will lead to policy and practice changes. And these conversations come from forming an anti-racist curriculum, one of Dr. Brown's goals for the school year ahead and school years to come. I've heard you say not only do you have to have a non-racist curriculum, you have to have an anti-racist yeah. curriculum. Can you talk about sort of what that looks like? Mm -hmm. Every one of our policies is oppressive, um, whether it's classist, racist, sexist, or ableist. Um, to be anti-racist and anti-oppressive, we need to be actively going after how do we write policies and implement practices that does not marginalize. Just take our curriculum, for example. Um, you went through our system, yeah. and how often did you engage in conversations about histories other than by a uh, Western or Europe, Europe, <laughs> Europe centric one? Yeah. Um, how often did you, we put in situations where you had to uncover the great histories of people of color? Yeah. 
or engage in a course or dialogue around race. Not a lot. Yeah. See, that's something that we can control. Yeah. Um, we need to very specifically embed that in all of our content areas for all of our young people and then assess it too. So we can make, we can make shifts to what we put in front of the kids tomorrow yeah. if we have the courageous, if we, if we have the courage and the political will to do so. In order to implement this curriculum, students will need to be roaming the halls of the school buildings and learning face to face, but accomplishing that won't be easy. On October 5th, the school district opened schools for in-person learning. However, just a few weeks later, they were forced to shut their doors for a bit due to rising COVID-19 cases. Obviously, this whole pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, as you're dealing with this, just, you know, the tragedies that, and, you know, specifically mm -hmm. the death of George Floyd mm -hmm. and everything that happened and just the amount of social awareness yeah. that it sparked. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I mean, what was that like to sort of not only, like I said, be dealing with that pandemic, but then all of a sudden the weight of that yeah. tragedy strikes. And I mean, was there, did it, did that sort of become the forefront or did that, or were you forced to kind of, I don't know, almost, you know, not pay as much attention to it and keep rolling with yeah. um, everything that you're st already having to deal with with the pandemic? No, and it's an important, it's another opportunity for us to think about perspective. Yeah. Um, these issues for me have always been here. I, most of my friends and people I grew up were dead. <laughs> They're dead because of health and social pandemics. Yeah. Um, not getting the right care, not having the money to get into, get care at all, um, violence, racism, oppression. So these issues have been here a long, long time. Again, it goes back to now, for, you know, we have permission to talk about it. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that these this new conversation, young people like yourself, because um, my generation failed your generation. We failed to engage in rich conversations about these issues. We failed in changing policies. But what I hope we've done is inspire people like you to take our places when we're gone. Yeah. And hopefully you will then now engage in the dialogue and the conflict to change the policies and practices that have led to these issues being here for a long, long time. Brown and his team of educators were ready to deal with whatever challenges came their way this school year. Even with sending the students back home to learn from their kitchen tables, they're committed to bringing students a safe and thoughtful education. The school district hopes to reopen their doors on November 6th, but Brown stressed that none of this is possible without the support of the community behind him. Folks are recognizing that we need to be a loving community in ways we weren't before. Yeah. Um, people, are, we truly are in this together. Um, you talk about, uh, you know, there's been no guidance, there's no playbook. The guidance we've received has changed, sometimes daily. So as we administrators, as we educators attempt to respond and to plan, that's been very difficult to do. And if not for the patience, uh, the commitment, the forgiveness, uh, the trust of a community, um, this will be impossible. So us being in person today is because of a community that is loving. Um, and that's the only reason.